Hello, this is Vintage Electronics Geek, and today here on Test Gear Tuesday, we're going to look at this audio frequency generator made by N6EZ Juliet, N6EZJ. Uh, I do not know if this is a one-of-a-kind, uh, home-built, if it was a kit-built, uh, a product that you could purchase in a magazine, uh, on a corner somewhere from a guy with a trench jacket in the back of a pickup truck. I just don't know. It's, I believe, from about 1984. Date codes range anywhere from 1977 to 1984. And as we go through this video and look at some photos that I have taken, you could see my quandary of uh, why I am confused and delusional. This is a really cool little AF generator. It covers from about 1 hertz all the way up to uh, 48,500 kilohertz. And as you saw, we do have a course control and a fine tune. We have um, our amplitude. Amplitude is only good for sine wave. Uh, do we have a sine wave? Yes, we do. And we have a square wave. We have our power on off and we have a internal external switch for the frequency counter, which is also a little confusing, perplexing. I don't understand why we need that, but we got one. And it's also confusing because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on where in the spectrum you are. As you can see, this frequency counter, uh, disguised as a as a audio frequency generator, looks really good right now. I've spent some time cleaning it up, and in fact, this is getting ready to go in production on my ever-growing workbench. As I get new test gear and expand, so do my shelves, and so do what's on there, and because of uh, some new test gear I've gotten here recently. I've had to make some changes. Shelf uh, space uh, became a little tight on one of the shelves. I've had to remove three pieces of items off of my shelves, one of them being a programmable audio frequency generator, which I've used for quite some time and I really like and I really prefer because it's programmable. But my shelving space is a little too tight and it just wouldn't fit so I had to for the time being remove it out of production but I hope one day to bring it back in so in its place I pulled this one out of my pile of junk and cleaned it up serviced it and uh, now I'm doing a video on it uh, I'm going to show you as far as ser servicing is concerned all I did was replace five capacitors These five right here to be more Pacific. These are uh, good name brand uh, capacitors. These two big fat ones are Nichicon, uh, 1000 microfarad at 35 volts, and I replaced them also with some Nichicon. And those ones actually tested good. I pulled them out of the board, tested them. I figure, well, I've got them out. I'm just going to go ahead and replace them with new ones, and I did. These little blue ones are sprigs, and they're 10 microfarads at uh, 25 volts. I couldn't see it. I had to pause for a moment and break up my flashlight and magnifying glass. These ones, all three of these, did check high, high ESRs, so I went ahead and replaced them with modern-day um, and uh, everything is fat and happy. When I got this, this was taped together. The uh, It don't have screws to keep the cabinet together, and it, it wouldn't matter anyway if it did, because as you see right here in this photo, when I opened it up, and I saw this big, massive bolt going through this transistor, my first thought was, well, okay, it's some kind of weird heat sinking uh, workaround. Seemed legit, why not? But after further examination, I found it was the cause of why the case would not smash together. And now you have to admit, 
you've probably never seen something like that your own self. It's first time for me. After servicing this device and I put it back together, I had to put it back with tape. And that's okay. Um, as you see right here in this photo, the uh, internal, um, I don't know, what do you call these legs, uh, are broken as you see in the photo. I do believe that if I had the right size uh, screw to go into them, that it probably would snug down. However, in the interim, I'm going to just keep this masking tape on it. I have a eBay search for a new case. I would like to replace this case with this very same one and not lose the, uh, the historic value of it. Interesting uh, tidbit, a side note about this case. This case was made by Pactech out of uh, Pennsylvania and this is model number 60251 as you can see here in this photo. Interesting tidbit about, uh, about the manufacturers of the company. Uh, as you see it's a division of uh, LaFrance Corp. Both Pactech and LaFrance Corp are still in production. Looking at their history on their webpage, LaFrance Corp has been around since 1946 and they are a emblem and logo maker. If you could think of a logo and design, you're familiar with their work. They've done Motorola, they've done GE, they've done Ford, a few other car dealerships, and, and a whole bunch of neat and groovy things. There will be a link to their website in the uh, uh, video notes down below, so if you are by chance interested, you can go check that out and uh, enjoy. Pactech is a division of uh, La France and that came into uh, existence in 1977 and there too will also be a link below uh, again if you're interested you can go check them out. Unfortunately they no longer have the case uh, a, a matching case uh, to replace this or I would have just bought one. As far as history on the device, the actual device itself, I can find absolutely nothing, um, nothing on the device. Again, as stated, I don't know if it's a one of a kind and that's why I'm not seeing it. I am kind of confused, a little perplexed, however, because the silk screening on the face are not stickers. That's actual true self, um, uh, silk screening. I forgot my word. So, I mean, when you touch it, there's no ridge. It's on there. And when I cleaned this all up, it did not fall off. So that's pretty good. Now, as far as N6EZJ himself, some research on him, I, I find that the old boy is still alive, and he currently resides in Las Vegas, and he still is an amateur operator, unfortunately, or however you want to take it, no longer under this call. Uh, since this call sign he has probably upgraded his uh, call five or six times that's probably the most I've ever seen anybody change your call sign if by chance you know how to get in touch with him uh, I would be uh, very much interested to speak with him so by chance point him to this video and have him make contact with me I, I would I would like to find out more information internally uh, where it's also a little perplexing is if you look at the the board here you you see the traces it's definitely not homemade uh, board this is a fiberglass board the traces look really nice now it's very plausible he got the idea from a electronics magazine and back in the day they used to give you uh, everything that you need to build this including the little circuit printout that you would etch your board and there you go. So it very well could be that. And if you look here at this photo, you could see some of the soldering work. Uh, at first I thought it might have been uh, uh, waved, floated, or whatever it's called. But looking at it underneath the magnifying glass, and here in the picture I think you could see where it does appear that it is hand done. So a little confusing, a little perplexing. Now, also looking at the parts, if you look here at the transformer, well, we could see that this came from Radio Shack. So again, confusing. So I thought, well, okay, maybe this was a Archer kit, and I did some research to see if indeed that was. And unfortunately, I did not find anything that resembled or looked like this. Um, 
Some of the parts very well could have came from Radio Shack outside of the uh, transformer. I didn't do any research to see if maybe these two controls uh, came from there. But as you look at the display, I don't think the display was a Radio Shack Tandy product. I'm not sure where this came from. If by chance you can figure this out with what little markings are on it, uh, let me know. And speaking of markings, here are some markings off of the board. And these are the only markings I see on the main board. There is no other markings on the case internally, externally, and no other markings on um, the uh, internal parts uh, that would indicate a manufacturer or date. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and get the show on the road. As stated, this device goes all the way down to 1 hertz. And I think this is either a 10 or a 15 turn fine tune adjustment. We were at the high end, so that's how long it took me to get to the low end. Putting it on a frequency counter, I find that it is pretty much spot on. Depend on where you are in spectrum, you may be a hertz or two off. For what this device is, I'm, I'm fat and happy with that resolution. Warm-up time is about 15 to 30 minutes, and then it stabilizes really well. This is not a lab-grade piece of gear, and, and again, I think for what it is, the, uh, the, the uh, accuracy is pretty decent. There is no frequency, uh, there is no crystal control, as you saw. This is just uh, controlled from mains um, frequency voltage. And again, I think it does pretty good. Display looks really good. I, I like everything about this. In, in camera, the display does look a little brighter than what it is in real life, but it, it's not bad. It's, it's what you would expect to see from the 1970s, about that uh, intensity. So let's go ahead and um, let me reposition my camera. We're going to point it at my scope and frequency counter, and we're going to look at some patterns and the frequency. Okay, here at first we're going to just look at it on a scope. Um, right now, like I said, we are at the bottom of the band on this device. And we have the um, amplitude turned all the way down. Let's go ahead and adjust it some. And you can see the uh, scope there has been tickled. And so that's the amplitude all the way up. And then we adjust it down. Let's go ahead and readjust. Looks like I'm blown out a little bit in camera. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's spin this up. And so now we're at uh, 51, uh, 5.1 hertz, or 51 hertz, sorry. Here we are at 10,000 hertz. And you see, it looks really good. We have a good, strong pattern. No distortion in it whatsoever. And even if we turn it down, the amplitude, really, really good good pattern. Let's go ahead and keep turning this up. And 
And so I'm not going to waste time spinning this all the way to the end. We know where it goes. But here at uh, 44,800 kilohertz, you could see our pattern and how nice that looks. It's an awesome, awesome pattern. Very nice. Now let's go ahead and do uh, put this on square wave. All right, so we're at bottom of the band. Let me readjust. And when we're in this mode here, uh, like most uh, function generators, you don't have control over your amplitude. It's at a fixed um, voltage. I haven't measured it to see where it's at. A couple of volts, I think. And let's go ahead and turn this on up. And as you see, once we got to about uh, 21 uh, hertz there, it straightened out. And we have a really nice, nice pattern. So we'll bring it back down, and now we'll go back up. So here we are at the high end of the band, and here at the high end of the band you can definitely see a really nice pattern. We got nice strong edges, there's no ringing. And as you notice, I am not terminating uh, this connection. So this is straight out of the device. So this is really, really nice and really, really impressive. So very, very nice. Kind of hoping to brighten it up a little bit to see if maybe there was something I wasn't seeing in the camera. The scope is uh, brighter than what it is in real life. So keep that in mind. Those of you who have filmed your scope know exactly what I'm referencing. Okay, fantastic. So we'll spin down in frequency. And as you see that scope, that pattern looks really nice. We've got good leading edge. This is here is where a digital scope would come in handy. See that better. That those dots is uh, on the lens. I need to clean the lens. Okay, lens has been cleaned. Must have been overspray from working on the bench. Keep going down. And that's typical kind of pattern once you get down to the bottom of the band and frequency in my experimentation. So I'm not tripping and dripping on that. That looks fantastic to me. And now we're going to look at it on a frequency counter. I have it in square wave mode and we have it all the way down at the bottom. And you could see here that um, what we're seeing here corresponds up there.
Let's, and we are still on a square wave. Let's go ahead and go all the way to the top of the band. But you see we're still agreeing. Still agreeing. Not quite agreeing, but it's close enough. I, I'm, I'm good with that. This um, frequency counter switch, like I said, is weird. All right, so now we still have frequency displayed on the counter. Our LED, LC, LED display, too many acronyms, uh, is still illuminated. So let's go ahead and turn this control to the bottom of the band. And you can confirm that because you see the frequency counter is turning or changing. All right, so still good, right? Go ahead and turn that back up. Let's put this on sine wave. Internal frequency counter. And you see we match frequencies pretty close. We'll turn that off. And then we'll turn this down. What's wrong one? Hmm. Weird. <laughs> when I tested this the other day when I worked on it, what happened was that display blinked off. Okay. Very weird. Oh, okay. Maybe it didn't blank off. Maybe it was, uh, as you saw, it came on. So I'm in square wave. I got this to the top of the band. I have the uh, amplitude here turned all the way to the bottom off. And now when I rotate it upward, watch the uh, display here. Now, I'm not uh, all the way up with the amplitude, so we keep increasing it, and we eventually get to the frequency. So, that's another question I'd like to ask uh, N6EZJ, is if that is by design. Interesting, right? Right. All right, so the next test, the last thing we're going to do is look at this on a audio spectrum analyzer and let's see what it looks like. Okay, so in this next uh, segment here, uh, we're looking at the audio spectrum analyzer. And as you can see, we are at 1 hertz at, uh, on sine wave. And you see the signal there looks really good. It is bouncing because, well, that's what one hertz does. Uh, it's low and slow. That is the tempo. And so we're going to adjust the uh, frequency spectrum. And you're going to see that increase. Now that little wiggle that you saw off to the left-hand side, that was actually part of the, the uh, noise floor. Um, so the left-hand side of the, the window there is your noise floor, and the bottom is your uh, frequency domain. And as you see here, the uh, device, uh, the frequency on the audio spectrum analyzer uh, stopped bouncing, and 
nice stable signal as you can see it looks really good and now we're just going to swing all the way across the spectrum and you notice there's this little blip right here that little blip is uh, I believe a parasitic let me adjust the, the sensitivity on that and so you see the uh, came in uh, parasitic there and then right here let me go back yeah so let's go ahead and read this real quick so we have a, a parasitic here we have our primary frequency here more parasitics and then this one right here is our uh, harmonic so that is how you read that so let's go ahead and turn the sensitivity down we'll leave it at that setting and then we'll just go ahead and go across the band and as you see that parasitic just stays in place so that looks really 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 good go ahead and bring this back in turn sensitivity down and then we're bouncing Let's go ahead and switch this over to a square wave. Okay, and so how we're reading this, this right here, that's our noise floor. You cannot go any further in frequency than that. That's, that's the bottom of the, the band right there. This tall one is our intermediate frequency that we're on and then our harmonics right here and I changed the frequency just a little bit well isn't that cool all those harmonics And you see we still have our parasitic right there. So it looks really, really, really good. Okay, well, that will do it for me in this episode. Again, if you have any information on this uh, device, it would be fantastic if you chime in and uh, able to share what you have. Uh, and also, if you're able to contact the, the guy who made this and uh, have him get in touch with me with any pertinent information on it, that would be swell as well. All right, thanks for watching this episode of Test Gear Tuesday. We will catch you in the next one. Thank you very much. Bye.